Now that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy that Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris L, and I'm your host. Uh, Every week I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today in the program is Adina Gillett. How's it going, Adina? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Adina is a longtime ensemble member in Jet City Improv. She is a creator and director of many comedy shows here in Seattle. She is also a hypnotherapist and has her own hypnotherapy business, Bear Creek Hypnotherapy. Yes. You you should say it, Bear Creek Hypnotherapy. Okay. Uh, How did you get into the hypnotherapy game? Um, A catalog. I saw, (laughs) you know, you thumb through the catalogs of Bellevue College and then they say something like professional intensive hypnotherapy training for the first time ever offered. And I thought, hypno? Sign me up. That's awesome. Yeah. I've done the same. Ever since I got out of college, I've always tried to take some kind of a class and it's taken me down weird roads. So that's awesome that you were just looking through a catalog and saw yeah. hypnotherapy. I'm kind of a class junkie. Yeah. I like taking a variety of classes. Me too. What what yes. what's what are some of the more interesting classes that you've taken? Um I have taken I have a mediation certification at U from UW Law. Cool. Because why wouldn't I? Right. Um that kind of thing. Um neuro linguistic programming is okay. another another thing that mm-hmm. I got into and uh, got certified, and I love being certified. Apparently, yeah. Yes. Awesome. I love it. Very cool, very cool. So uh, how long have you lived in the Seattle area? Uh, since 93, mm-hmm. so however many years that is. That is some years. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what brought you out here? Microsoft. Okay. Um, from uh, my fiancé and I moved out here mm-hmm. from UCLA to for him to work at Microsoft. Oh, okay. And you're from California? Yes. Awesome. San Diego. Uh, how much do you know about local history? Um, I've picked up things here and there, but I am definitely not an expert on Seattle history. Okay, cool. Are you neurolinguistic programming me right now? Would it matter if I was? No, it would not matter if you were. Then no. Okay, awesome. Uh, and you can learn more about her uh, hypnotherapy business at bearcreekhypnotherapy.com. Yes. If you want to quit smoking or... Uh, stop your fear of flying. Oh, okay, cool. Or just be generally more awesome. Awesome. Uh, so you don't know what we're going to be talking about today, correct? No, I have no idea. Cool. So let's get started. Great. Uh, Seolk was born on what is now called Blake Island in the Puget Sound into the Duwamish tribe sometime around 1786. And I am probably pronouncing that name poorly. Uh, I hope so. It's uh, Lachutzid, and it's written in the International Phonetic Alphabet because that was not a written language. Um, so there's a glottal stop in there, so that's... I think there were nine glottal stops in there, uh, if I counted correctly. Seal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, With a little sorry. bit of a ratcheting sound at the end of it there. Right. I heard recordings of how it's pronounced, but that's, that's as good as I can do. Now, it sounds really good. Oh, thank you. Uh, he was born into a prosperous family, uh, being called Siaab, meaning being born of noble birth. His father, Shweyabe, was a Tai'i, or chief of the Suquamish tribe, and his mother, Sholisa, was of the Duwamish tribe near what is now Kent. Wow. Uh, I didn't know Kent was so royal. It was, yeah. To the natives. Yes. It was. The, all, the, all the land was sacred to before the white man came. Right. Look mm-hmm. what we did. Yeah, exactly. We turned it into Kent. Yeah, Kent. Oh, man. His noble status was confirmed during a vision quest he went on during his youth, where he received Thunderbird power from a supernatural wealth giver. Wow. Went on a vision quest and... Yeah, like that 80s movie. Vision Quest? Yes. Yeah. You know the movie. I don't know the movie. What? Matthew Modine? No, I don't... It's amazing. He's a wrestler and he goes on a vision quest. Okay. Uh Uh-uh. That's that's the end of my story about vision. It has a great song. Okay. And we have a really good soundtrack about working out. I'll have to check that out. You have to check it Does out. Does it have a montage? Of course okay. it has a montage. Right. That's a stupid question, right? And eight blood old stops. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a young lad of around six years old, he stood on the banks of the Puget Sound and saw an incredible sight. A three-mast sailing ship cutting through the water. 
Uh, it was the HMS Discovery, captained by George Vancouver, sailing into the Puget Sound to make maps. Uh, it was the first time European contact had been made in this area. Oh. How so, did it go? Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, there's uh, hundreds of years uh, of, of history after that. Oh, but good. This is the first contact. So he's standing on the banks. and That's got to be like watching a UFO land. Yes. Because the technology is just so much farther advanced to see something like that sailing into harbor. Must be just, I, I can't even imagine how, how much that must have blown his mind, blown everybody's mind that was out here. Well, even to be a six-year-old today and see something amazing That's like true. That. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, sea Oak was one on, in one of the canoes that approached the ship and made first contact with the white people on board. So he's part of this first contact. Mm -hmm. When trade routes were set up in the Oregon country, Sea Oak became a frequent trader at Fort Nisqually, bringing in beaver and sea otter pelts in exchange for wool blankets and other Western goods. Oh, wow. Very ambitious for mm -hmm. a young man. Oh, yes. Yeah. He was known up and down the Puget Sound, where there are many tri tribes, the Duwamish, Suquamish, Puyallup, Muckleshoots, Nahomish, Nisqually, and Snoqualmie, among others. All the tribes who lived on the Puget Sound up to about present-day Anacortes had a common language, Lachutseed. So they were all able to communicate with each other, from about Olympia to Anacortes. Convenient. We mm -hmm. can't even do that today. No, that's not. I don't speak Kent. Nope. I don't speak Bellingham. Oh, okay. Those jokers <laughs> up there right? in Bellingham. Bellingham? Mm-hmm. Uh, sea Oak was a natural leader, and one event solidified this. Uh, the Suquamish and Duwamish tribes had a confederation, and when Sea Oak was in his 20s, the tribes were under attack. Tribes from the north were invading their territory, coming down the Green River. Uh, sea Oak called for the cutting down of trees to be laid across the river, forcing the invader canoes to capsize, or making it possible to attack and defeat the incoming invasion. So Damn it! So the trees and go down. Get it? Oh, yeah. Right. Hey. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's more where that came Okay, right. sweet. Looking Sorry. forward to it. Sorry. Uh, the plan was successful, and the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes were victorious, defeating the invaders and taking the survivors as slaves. Hmm. Uh, the tribes were so impressed with Sea Oak's leadership that they made him the new Tai, and all the previous leaders became sub-chiefs. So he's now chief of the Suquamish and Duwamish tribes. Wow, and he must have pissed off a lot of subchiefs in the process. Probably, yeah. Probably people would have not been very happy about no, that. No, that's like the intern getting promoted at work. Something like that, yeah. Right, yeah. and suddenly being the CEO. He's younger, he's the he's the up-and-coming guy, but right? he's he's virile, he's a warrior, he's he's a fighter. Right, he's and got so, all the new things. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Sea Oak stood tall at six feet, towering over his tribe. French fur traders gave him the nickname Le Gros, meaning the big one. Mm. Francis Heron, head trader at Fort Nisqually, asked him to sign a treaty agreeing that he wouldn't kill anyone. Oh. He's a very big, imposing guy. I didn't know you could do that. You can ask somebody to sign a treaty not to kill someone? That would solve so many things. Well, he's saying we won't, I think he's saying we, we won't trade with you if you kill someone. Oh. That we will kind of, uh, not not just in general. It's not just, where's that don't kill anyone form? Hey, I was going to kill somebody, but then you held up that you piece of paper that, and I was like, oh, yeah, right. That right. form I signed. Yeah. Uh, Sia Oka did not abide by that, and he mm. killed a Skykomish shaman in 1837. Oh. Not as a part of war. Just just for fun. Not sure exactly what happened, but he, he got angry and killed the Skykoma shaman. I'm not I sure what the conflict was. Killing a shaman doesn't bode well. I would not imagine in any culture. Yeah, probably not. But I, it's... You know, I tend to avoid killing shamans. You, okay, you do? Well, you you, you don't play dangerously. No. You, you're playing it safe. Really, really keeping my cool around the yeah. shamans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In 1841, he led a raid on the Yalakwo village as revenge against their killing of one of his kinsmen. And in 1847, led a Suquamish raid on the Chimicum near present-day Port Townsend and wiped them out. That's a lot of raiding. A lot of raiding. He's he's fighting a lot. He's killing a lot of people. There's a lot, a lot. of anger issues. There's a lot of conflicts going on between the tribes. Yes. The tribes are all trading, but they also war with each other, and they take each other as slaves when they get captured. And that's basically what was going on in the Puget Sound for... 12,000 years. You People know, are living in harmony with nature, but they're also in conflict with each other. Right. Some tribes consider other tribes less than human. Sort of like the Hillary versus Bernie people uh i think this is more than that oh but is it oh, probably okay. yeah i don't know they're, I don't, are they all killing each other at this point uh, well you know i, I it's think getting there maybe just metaphorically yes maybe by the time this podcast is released that will uh there'll that will be happen. carnage outside oh man i hope not 
Uh, he married, but his first wife died, so he took another. Um, one of his sons was killed in a raid, and it had a deep effect on him. Aww. The number of white settlers had been slowly growing, and churches were being established up and down the Puget Sound. In 1848, he was baptized into the Ch Catholic Church at the St. Joseph New Market Mission in Olympia, and he took the spiritual name Noah. On the register, his na re name read Noah Seattle. It was no. spelled with an I. Wow. Seattle. Uh, he also had children, ba his children baptized and raised as Catholics. So, this is Chief Seattle we're talking about. This is Chief Seattle! This is Chief Seattle. Wow, he had quite a childhood. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's really growing up in this incredible transitionary time where the way that things have been going on the Puget Sound for thousands and thousands of years change really quickly and really dramatically with the uh, arrival of these white settlers. Wow, amazing. That come in. Just this huge, huge platform shift, huge turn that happens, and he's right in the thick of it. Wow, ground zero. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, in 1850, the Donation Land Claim Act went into effect, meaning that any white settlers who wished to journey to the Oregon Territory, of which Washington was still a part, could claim 320 acres of land for a single man or 640 acres for a married couple. Oh, wait. Did the Donation Land Claim? Donation Land Claim Act. So how does, how does that work? You, who's making the donations? Uh, so what happened was there was a, a everything basically from the northern part of California, so where Oregon is, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, a little bit of what's now Western Montana and British Columbia were kind of a disputed territory for a long time. Um, we were calling it the Oregon country. The Great Britain, which had control of Canada, was calling it the Columbia country. So in 1846, they established the border as the 49th parallel, which is where it is today. Um, so there's not a lot of people have moved out west to occupy this land yet, and they're trying to get get white people basically to move out here for a variety of reasons, uh, some semi-contradictory. They're trying to displace the native population mm -hmm. uh, in order to solidify the claim on this land in order to try to, try to avoid future conflicts. Also, uh, the Civil War is looming. Sure. Um, there's a bunch of uh, political maneuvering going on in Washington, D.C. So the Mexican-American War ended in 1848, and California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all of that area becomes a part of the United States, and that's all in the south. That's all beneath the line that says it's okay to have slaves. So there's a concern that they're going to get political power and shift all this political power to the slave owning states. So people are trying, they're trying to, the northerners are trying to get people to move out here in the north in order to get more polit northern political power. That totally makes sense. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on. So it's this weird, like, confluence of events. And then there's the, uh, the 1850 compromise, which says California can't have, be a, won't be a slave holding state, but they'll make it a part of the union. And there's, there's right. just a whole bunch of stuff going on. Here's your form. You may not do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because we learn a lot about the Civil War in high school and in history class, but I, feel, I felt like we were always kind of brushed over the like 20 years leading up to the Civil War, all the like right. political maneuverings and trying to get, but that's essentially what this is largely a part of. So they're trying to get people to move out here. So they're saying if you're white or at least Kind of white? I think, I think you had to be half or possibly three quarters white. I think it was half white to, uh, get free land during the Donation Land Claim Act. Because they wanted to be able to give land to the family members of settlers who had come out here and intermarried with the locals. The local natives. The local natives, yeah. Gotcha. So, basically, yeah, if you move out here, you can get free land. If you're a single man, 320 acres. If you're a married couple, 640 acres. Uh, that's a square mile. So a lot of people start moving out here to get that land. And if you're like into polygamy and you've got an extra lady, does that buy you more land? No, you can't. Because that was a thing. Uh, that came up. That happened. Mm -hmm. uh, where people were, were were bigamists, but you couldn't you couldn't claim more land. You, <sighs> the most you could claim was 640 acres land for a couple. And that that ended bigamy. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, there's but, a no benefit. Well, out women, here. single women couldn't get free land. Right. As part of this, so if you if if a man was married to a woman and the two of them claimed six hundred and forty acres, the woman could ought not also get three hundred and twenty acres. Right, because she's a lady. Because she, she's a lady. <laughs> if you had the other way, where it was a man and a woman who were married, and then the the their third was another man, he could claim his three hundred and twenty acres. But then they had a whole other mess. No, it was of good for the man with. cave on the other square mile. <laughs> yeah, the other square mile. You have to have space for that. <laughs> mm Hmm. Uh, so a group of 24 men and women from Illinois, led by Arthur Denny, decided to claim land on Elliott Bay. 
Um, so they came out here to the Pacific Northwest, and they arrived on Elliott Bay, and Denny called the new settlement Dewamps. 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 Just, yes, this predated the doo-wop era of yeah, the 1950s. It did, yeah. By, by, by a bit. By a little. By a bit, yeah. So doo they set up doo out on Alki Point. Um, seeing the settlers were coming in, Sea Oak actively sought out white pioneers he could trade and do business with. He met a San Francisco merchant named Charles Fay, and the two set up a fishery on Elliott Bay. Uh, he traveled to Olympia to do business and met a doctor named David Swinson Maynard. He convinced Doc Maynard to come and join him on Elliott Bay. Uh, Maynard and the Denny Party joined forces and changed the name of the small community to Seattle, an anglicized version of Sea Oak in honor of their patron. Wow. That's a really, really good gift. Yeah. Well, he had probably had mixed feelings about that. That Sea Oak did? Sea, yeah. Because you're never supposed to say the name of a chief after he dies, or his spirit will never be at rest. So we're not real sure how he felt about that. He probably would have had mixed feelings about having this town named after him. Wow. Uh, so Maynard opened up the Seattle Exchange, which sold dry goods. But even though he changed his name to Noah, right? Noah Salt was his spiritual, or Noah Seattle was his uh, spiritual name. So when you when you get baptized right. into the church, apparently, I don't know, I'm not Catholic, but uh, you take that spiritual name. Sure, sure, okay. So I guess maybe if you if you don't have a, a if you are have a native name, you would take on a right. A, Bad. So you would think maybe if it was his native name, then only native rules apply. But if it's his church name, then he wouldn't mind if oh. it was said after death. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know I'm either. I'm not sure. Oh, too bad he's not around. We could ask him. We could ask him. Hey, Seal. <laughs> uh, Seattle was trying to... So I'll kind of be switching back and forth between Seattle and Seal. Okay. Uh, so Seattle was trying to secure his people's future in harmony with the imminent waves of white settlers who would surely be coming to populate the territory. This effort would prove to be troublesome. Isaac Ingalls. What a shocker. Yeah, right? <laughs> really? Yeah, you think, this, no. that's not the end of the story. Historically, and everybody... it's gone so well yeah, when the right? white man has arrived. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, huh. they came, they were greeted as liberators. Right? That's very odd. Ooh, okay. yeah. Isaac Ingalls Stevens was a veteran of the Mexican-American War, and in 1853, when Washington became its own territory, he was appointed as the first territorial governor, a position which went in tandem with being superintendent of Indian affairs. Attentive. Superintendent of Indian affairs. Uh, superintendent. Oh, intent. Oh, superintendent. Su- superintendent, yeah. Oh, gotcha. Like, of the schools. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, he was super attentive, but not in a great way. Not in a good way. Yeah. Like in schools. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, in January of 1854, Isaac Stevens visited the small town of Seattle. On the occasion, Chief Seattle gave a speech that has been repeated many times in many different forms. The words we know as Chief Seattle's famous speech were not verbatim. They were published more than 20 years later from memory by Dr. Henry Smith, who was present but did not transcribe the speech directly or even speak the language Seattle was speaking. So this is just like the Bible happened. Something like that, yeah. This is years later... He writes it down, and he probably changes some things to suit his own purposes, but we don't right. really know. He didn't actually speak Lachute Seed. So Seattle would have given speech in Lachute Seed. It would have had to translate it to Chinook, which is a trade jargon, and then into English. And then there's all those guttural stops. Yeah, so hard to tell. Really hard. Hard to tell. Uh, the speech dealt with environmental issues, the treatment of natives, and a variety of other topics. Uh, Chief Seattle was considerably taller than Governor Stevens and spent the entirety of the address with one hand on Stevens's head. Oh! <laughs> yeah. How rude! Yeah, right? Yeah. Wow, I, that's incredibly condescending. Yeah, it is. Probably we didn't intend it to be, but oh. we don't mm. We don't know. Cause Chief He's Seattle's, killed a lot of folks. He has, yeah. He could have easily killed Stevens yeah. right then. That's probably, I think that's what actually that means. That's is, the international I, sign for, <laughs> I can kill you at any moment. That's the, be cool, yep. just be cool. I can use this hand and just yeah. twist this head around. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of this episode, I'll actually read the entirety of the, the Chief Seattle speech as recorded, reported by Henry Smith. Awesome. Uh, the Donation Land Claim Act had stipulated that white settlers could take what land they wanted and did not need a release from native tribes. And this led to conflicts and deaths because the most desirable lands were populated already. Of course. So the nice, you know, fishing areas and the meadows next to, next to fresh water. All the best supermarkets, the yeah. movie theaters. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stevens wanted to end the conflicts between whites and natives, and his response was to simply divide the territory into divisions for natives and divisions for whites. 
he assigned Indian agents to locate tribal leaders and have them sign treaties agreeing to this arrangement. According to historian David M. Berg, quote, not only was the timetable reckless, the whole enterprise was organized in profound ignorance of native society, culture, and history. The 20,000-odd aboriginal inhabitants who were assumed to be in rapid decline were given a brutal choice. They would adapt to white society or they could disappear. You know, this is what I think of as our pride times. Yeah, this is... You know, this is- this is this is where our time to shine. This is the high water mark of American yes, history. Yes, our culture. Mm-hmm. Look at us go. Uh, in this matter, Governor Stevens was actually seen as a moderate because many people were advocating for genocide. Ugh. They said, "Just let's let's just kill them all." Here's the form. Yeah, that horrible. Sign this form. Horrible, dark, dark chapter wow. in our history. A series series of treaties were drawn up where the natives would sign away the land they had been living on for 12,000 years in exchange for relocation to small reservations. In January of 1855, the Point Elliott Treaty was signed by Chief Seattle, which gave legal ownership of the Puget Sound Basin to the United States in exchange for reservations, education, health care, and money. He ceded 2.5 million acres of land, and reservations were formed for the Suquamish, but not the Duwamish. I would imagine that the hominin reservation was really came into play here, having reservations about these reservations. Yeah, yeah. That's probably where that word came from. Yeah. With extreme it's, reservation. We agree to this, yes, go to this reservation. This horrible agreement. You did say you had more puns. So. I, oh, I'm just getting started. Just, okay, all right, just getting warmed up. Yep. Several chiefs of other tribes signed the Point Elliott Treaty as well, and other similar treaties were signed around the territory. It is likely the natives did not understand the full ramifications of what they were saying. Everything had to be, or uh, signing. Everything had to be translated multiple times from English to Chinook, the trade jargon, uh, which was more suitable for simple business transactions than complex legal matters, and then from Chinook to Lachutseed, and then back the other way around. Oh, this is babblefish. Right. Hell. Yeah. So it just keeps going back and forth. Ugh. Many natives were furious over the treaties and knew they had been taken advantage of. In October, natives conducted conducted raids and killed settlers in King County and Thurston County. Acting Governor Charles Mason ordered the formation of militias and had them meet in Seattle. Settlers built blockhouses to protect themselves. In present-day Auburn, Lieutenant Slaughter was ambushed and killed. Wait a minute. Lieutenant Slaughter? Lieutenant Slaughter. Was ambushed and killed. Killed. So in Auburn used to be called Slaughter after Lieutenant Slaughter. And then with they decided that was a they bad just idea. Couldn't live with that. So Lieutenant Slaughter was killed in that in that little valley where Auburn is. Um they Slaughter Valley. They named uh the post office the Slaughter Post Office. And then they built a hotel across the street and they named that the Slaughter House. Of of course and they And so did. then they ended up naming the whole town Slaughter. Until years later, some settlers from Auburn, New York, came and said, this is a really terrible name this for a city. This is a terrible name. Let's name it Auburn. Auburn, of mm-hmm. course. Although Slaughter, I've been to Auburn many times, and Slaughter is a more appropriate name for... I, and I would agree that the Slaughterhouse sounds like a pretty cool place to go. It's pretty badass, yeah. yeah. Where'd you stay on vacation? Oh, I stayed at the Slaughterhouse. Mm-hmm. Yep. Also one of my favorite books. Oh, oh yeah. right. Mm-hmm. I read the prequels one to four. The prequels? Oh, Slaughter, Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the conflict would go on for years and became known as the Treaty War. Doc Maynard, who was the local Indian agent, helped move 434 natives to West Seattle where they would be safe uh, from the militias and the vigilante groups that were coming. Wait, Doc Maynard did this? Doc Maynard did that. So he was like the Schindler of the time. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's actually a really good comparison. Wow. He is the Native American agent. He has really great relationships. He's close friends with Chief Seattle. He really is more than most people sees Indians as equals to the whites, which is not the common attitude at the time. And so, yeah, he uh, he says, let's all get you over to the other side of the bay. He actually helps a lot of his personal expenses in order to help people get over to West, what's now West Seattle in order to help people, to help them get safe. And now I'm just picturing him looking like Liam Neeson. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's forever now what Doc Maynard looks like. Okay, to me. he is cast in your mind yep. as Liam Neeson. Yeah, yes, he just is. don't take his daughter. No, mm-hmm. I will find you. Yeah. The U.S. Navy ship Decatur was posted in Puget Sound. January 21st, 1856, uh, Chief Seattle, along with his daughter, Kika Soblu, uh, better known today as Princess Angeline, warned the estimated 50 residents of Seattle that an attack was coming. 
You've heard of Princess Angeline? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was actually Doc Maynard's wife, Catherine, uh, Catherine Maynard, who said, that is not a good enough name for a woman as pretty as you. Your name is now Angeline. Oh. Which is a super condescending and kind of shitty thing to say to that someone. It really is. So that's why we know her today as Princess Angeline. That's like an asshole Ellis Island. It really is, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to make a lot of Jewish immigration references, if that's okay. That's fine. Okay, That's good. fine. You do you. Great. Mm-hmm. So puns and Jewish immigration references. Look at my website. Yeah. <laughs> On the morning of Saturday, January 26th, an unknown number of natives took to the hills surrounding the small town of Seattle. The Navy ship Decatur was positioned in Elliott Bay and fired shells at a house on First Hill that was believed to be housing hostile natives. The citizens of Seattle fled to the blockhouses for protections, many of which were native women and children who were married to the children of settlers, or married or the married to or the children of settlers. And there were only 50. There's only 50. there's only a handful of people living in Seattle at this All right. time. Uh, the Decatur continued to fire into the city and the surrounding wooded area. The invading natives shot back, but the Decatur had superior weapons and had greater range and was able to hold the attackers back. Some made it into the small town and set fire to buildings. Around noon, the attackers stopped firing, presumably to eat, and women and children were evacuated onto the Decatur and another ship in Elliott Bay. Oh. So trying to uh, evacuate the city. Okay. By 10 p.m., all firing had stopped and the Battle of Seattle was over. Two settlers were killed in the attack. An estimated 200 to 500 natives were killed, but no Indian bodies were ever found. Because why? They would drag them away. Oh, their, they, their they friends would, would drag them away. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what you should do. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the Battle of Seattle. I had never heard of that. No? And it's got yeah. a really catchy name. It does have a really really catchy name for a really horrible event. It does. Well, you got to sell it somehow. That's, that's true. Uh, the damage to the small town was rebuilt in three weeks. Snoqualmie Chief Pat Canham put out a reward of $20 for the head of any native who would attack Seattle and $80 for any chief who would help orchestrate the attack. Governor Stevens ordered court martials for around 20 natives, but they were later discharged. Uh, the attacks were believed to have been orchestrated by Nisqually Chief Leshai and Klickitat Yakima Chief Awi. Uh, Leshai was captured eventually. He had, been previously, he had previously been amenable to white settlers signing the Medicine, Treat Cre Medicine Creek Treaty. Mm -hmm. Which is like the Point Elliott Treaty. Okay. But farther to the east. Uh, Leshai was already wanted for fighting in other conflicts against the settlers, specifically the murder of Colonel A. Benton Moses, who died during a battle where there were deaths on each side. Oh, well, that seems fair. That there were deaths on each side? Yeah. Yeah, but Leshai is tried, now he's being tried in the civilian court for murder mm -hmm. for the events that happened during this battle. Okay. Uh, Leshai was turned in by his nephew Slugia for the reward money. Slugia, the Slugia, traitor! Yeah, Slugia was promptly killed by one of Leshai's top men. Good! So he got the money, but immediately after, he himself is killed. Oh, that'll learn ya. Yeah, he got his comeuppance. <laughs> yup! Yeah. What you got? That's called the Slugia lesson. The Slugia lesson? <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, gonna take that with me. The Slugia lesson? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Chief Seattle attempted to arrange clemency for Leshai, but was unsuccessful. His lawyer, H.R. Crosby, who incidentally was the grandfather of Bing Crosby, <gasps> uh, argued that Leshai did not kill Moses and that it was during war, which meant he shouldn't be tried in a civilian court. Because that's how the law works. Wait a minute, he was Bing Crosby's grandfather? Yeah, Bing Crosby was from Tacoma. Get out of here! I will not. Okay, then yeah. stay. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bing Crosby's grandfather was a lawyer for Chief Leshai. Wow! Yeah, it's a weird little connection. Yes! Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the first trial ended in a hung jury, and the second convicted Leshai. During the trial, he said, quote, I, don't, I, don't, I do not know anything about your laws. I have supposed that the killing of armed men in wartime was not murder. If it was, the soldiers who killed Indians are guilty of murder, too. I went to war because I believed that the Indian had been wronged by the white man, and I did everything in my power to beat the Boston soldiers. But for lack of numbers, supplies, and ammunition, I have failed. I deny that I had any part in the killing. As God sees me, this is the truth. Leshai was hanged on February 19th, 1858. Oh, I wish I could have met him. Leshai? That's an amazing speech. Yeah, he's he's a powerful leader, for sure. Oh. In On March 4th, 2004, the Washington State Senate formally recognized the trial as an injustice. And on that took a long time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, better late than never. 146 years? Yeah. Yeah. 
December 10th, 2004, a special historical court convened consisting of present and former members of the Washington State Supreme Court and exonerated Leshy on the murder charge. So why do they do that? Why do they waste their time, 150 years later, exonerating a dead person? Why that's, do you think they do that? It's ceremonial. Okay. You think it's, I mean, they're retired. They're retired court, su- state Supreme Court judges. So they were like on a Florida beach withholding drinks, kind of going, yay, uh, let's that's, do this I thing. don't know if that's exactly what they were doing. That's but how I picture that's it. That's how you picture it? Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's ceremonial, obviously. It's, it's symbolic. Um, trying to address the injustices of the past. Make amends. And it's not taking present day court time, but it, it's, it's an acknowledgement of the mistreatment that happened. Well, that is nice. And not trying to sweep things under the, under the rug, trying to bring things out into the open and saying this, this was a travesty of justice and we should address this. Absolutely. Although it's entirely ceremonial, it's not, right. obviously it's not going to un, undead him. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, Chief Seattle continued to form relationships and connection with the white settlers. In 1865, an ordinance was passed that prevented natives from having residence within the city limits. The, For the natives could not have residence, so they were not allowed to live here. Right. In 1865. 1865. And then later they were not able to come out here after dark. Well, in 1865, right when the Civil War ends in the South, on the other side of the country. Yeah, we're that's fighting a, that for is freedom, interesting. And then the complete opposite is happening over here. Yeah. Uh, He had been greatly respected by Native and white alike, but as larger waves of white settlers were coming in, he lost a great deal of clout. One day, a 10-year-old girl pushed the aging chief off a sidewalk (gasps) because Indians within city limits were supposed to give the right of way to whites no matter what. What a bitch. Yeah, right? Man. Yeah. I hope she got her her slugly lesson. Her slugia lesson? Slugia lesson. Yeah. Did she tell me she did? I don't know. We don't know. I don't know who she is. We don't know what happened to her. Ugh. But I'm going to say, yeah, she got her Sligia lesson. Let's just hope and imagine that she did. I bet she's not even alive today. I hope she is. You hope she is? I hope she's just a pile of dirt with feelings. Wow. And pain. (laughs) That's, you're cold. I know. (laughs) Uh, He spent most of his later years on the reservation trying to help his people with with disease and the serious problem of whiskey and alcoholism among the natives. Uh, Sia Oak, also known as Chief Seattle, and Noah Self died of a fever on June 7th, 1866. He was buried with both Catholic and Native rites. He is buried at Port Madison Reservation. His tombstone reads, quote, Seattle, Chief of the Suquamps and Allied Tribes, died June 7th, 1866. Firm friend of the whites, and for him the city of Seattle was named by its founders. On the reverse side it says, baptismal name, Noah Self, age probably 80 years. Wow. Yeah. So was he was he buried within the city limits? Did you say? No, he was buried on the reservation. Oh, on the reservation. Yeah, so he was not buried within the city limits. And that's who our city is named. That's after, who our city is named after. Who wasn't allowed to live in it? He was not. No. Well, that's crazy. Yeah, isn't that? I I think we all have kind of a lot of ideas about Chief Seattle. That at least I did, and I think a lot of people do about. Uh, we have this kind of concept of the noble savage, I think, that's yeah. been thrown around a lot about just communing with nature. And, I mean, he was a very, he was a violent man. He killed a lot of people. He was a warrior. He was a fighter. A business person. Um, a, a, a shrewd businessman. Yeah. Um, he was he was a very complicated figure and a very controversial figure at his time. A lot of people were really unhappy with him for fi- signing the, uh, uh, the, the treaty. His own people. His own yeah, people. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just think it's absolutely incredible that he cannot live in the city. He couldn't live in the city. He couldn't live in the city he was named after. He was named. Yeah. That was named for him. Right. And that a 10-year-old girl could push him off the sidewalk with impunity because she was white and he was not. And that 10-year-old girl grew up to be Ann Coulter. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. Just a pile of dirt with feelings. Pile of dirt with feelings. Yeah. Pain. yeah. Pain and, and that's the story of Chief Seattle and, and Chief Leshai, who is also a, a fascinating In badass. Figure. Leshai was a badass, yeah. Leshai was very smart. Uh, he was he was another fighter, another warrior, another great leader. He got a park, right? He got a neighborhood. I guess he did get a whole, whole neighborhood, neighborhood. yeah. Which he uh, wouldn't also, have been allowed to live in either. Right. And probably the whitest neighborhood in Seattle oh. also. Oh, as you know well, that they're that, raising their fists. Somewhere, yeah, looking down at the white, white city, yeah, with their names. Well, actually, the uh, the dead are not altogether powerless. Is how his speech ends, <gasps> basically saying that uh, all, uh, e- even when the streets are quiet at night, the 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 dead are the dead 
natives are still here. Okay, They're so tied to the land. That explains why this morning when I was driving in my car, mm-hmm. the passenger side seat belt suddenly started moving all on its own. Mm-hmm. There was nobody sitting in the passenger side seat, and it was going in and out and in and out all on its own. Now I know who was doing it. There's no other explanation. It's the only possible explanation. Mm. Well, thank you so much for listening to the Seattle <laughs> Files. Thank you so much, Adina, for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I learned a ton. Excellent. Uh, subscribe and rate the show in iTunes. Leave us a review on iTunes if you can. Like us on Facebook. We're also on Twitter at, at the Seattle Files. Uh, new episodes come out every Tuesday with a new topic and a new guest. I also have some live performances that are going to be coming up that I'm happy to announce. Um, J- July 14th, which is a Thursday, we'll be doing a live recording of the Seattle Files at Central Cinema. Uh, we'll be talking about cryptozoology and then do a live audio uh, commentary while watching Harry and the Hendersons. Um, It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Nancy Guppy from Almost Live is going to be on that episode as well as a couple of my former guests. Uh, Once again, we're doing a show at Bumbershoot this year with uh, John Keister, David B. Williams, and Kate Yeager. That's going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to get your tickets for that. Uh, I think they might be out now, but if they're not, then get them when they come out. Uh, Thank you for listening. Be back next Tuesday. Yonder sky that has wept tears of compassion on their fathers for centuries untold, and which, to us, looks eternal, may change. Today it is fair, tomorrow it may be overcast with clouds. My words are like the stars that never set. What Seattle says the great chief Washington can rely upon with as much certainty as our pale-faced brothers can rely upon the return of the seasons. The son of the white chief says his father sends us greetings of friendship and goodwill. This is kind, for we know that he has little need of our friendship in return because his people are many. They are like the grass that covers the vast prairies, while my people are few and resemble the scattering trees of a storm-swept plain. The great, and I presume also good, white chief sends us word that he wants to buy our lands but is willing to allow us to to reserve enough to live on comfortably. This indeed appears generous, for the red man no longer has rights that he need respect, and the offer may be wise also, for we are no longer in need of a great country." There was a time when our people covered the whole land, as the waves of the wind-ruffled sea cover its shell-paved floor. But that time has long since passed away with the greatness of tribes now almost forgotten. I will not mourn over our untimely decay, nor reproach my pale-faced brothers for hastening it, for we, too, may have been somewhat to blame. When our young men grow angry at some real or imaginary wrong, and disfigure their faces with black paint, their hearts also are disfigured and turn black. And then their cruelty is relentless and knows no bounds, and our old men are not able to restrain them. But let us hope that hostilities between the red man and his pale-faced brothers may never return. We would have everything to lose and nothing to gain. True it is that revenge with our young braves is considered again even at the cost of their own lives, but old men who stay at home in times of war and old women who have sons to lose know better. Our great father Washington, for I presume he is now our father as well as yours, since George has moved his boundaries to the north, our great and good father, I say, sends us word by his son, who no doubt is a great chief among his people, and that if we do as he desires, he will protect us. His brave armies will be to us a bristling wall of strength, and his great ships of war will find harbors so that our ancient enemies far to the northward, the Simsiums and Haidas, will no longer frighten our women and old men. Then he will be our father, and we will be his children." But can this ever be? Your God loves your people and hates mine. He folds his strong arms lovingly around the white man and leads him as a father to his, leads his infant son. But he has forsaken his red children. He makes your people wax strong every day, and soon they will fill the land, while my people are ebbing away like the fast-receding tide that will never flow again. The white man's God cannot love his red children where he would protect them. They seem to be orphans who can look nowhere for help. How then can we become brothers? How can your father become our father and bring prosperity and awaken us in us dreams of returning greatness? Your God seems to us to be partial. He came to the white man. We never saw him. He ne- we never even heard his voice. He gave the white man laws, but he has no word for his red children whose teeming millions fill this vast continent as the stars fill the firmament. No, we are two distinct races and must remain ever so. There is little in common between us. The ashes of our ancestors are scattered and their final resting place is hollowed ground, while you wander away from the tombs of your fathers seemingly without regret. Your religion was written on tablets of stone by the iron finger of an angry god, lest you might forget it. The red man could never remember nor comprehend it. 
Our religion is the traditions of our ancestors, the dreams of our old men given them by the Great Spirit, and the vision of our sacrums and is written in the hearts of our people. Your dead cease to love you and the homes of their nativity as soon as they pass the portals of the tomb. They wander far beyond, far off beyond the stars, are soon forgotten, and never return. Our dead never forget the beautiful world which gave them being. They still love its winding rivers, its great mountains, and its sequestered vales, and they ever yearn in tenderest affection over the lonely-hearted living and often return to visit and comfort them. Day and night cannot dwell together. The red man has ever fled the approach of the white man as the changing mists on the mountainside flee before the morning blazing sun. However, your propositions seem a just one, and I think my folks will accept it and retire to the reservation you offer them, and we will dwell apart and in peace, for the words of the great white chief seem to be the voice of nature speaking to my people out of the thick darkness that is fast gathering around them like a dense fog floating inward from a midnight sea. It matters but little where we pass the remainder of our days. There are not many. The Indian's night promises to be dark. No bright stars hover above the horizon. Sad voice winds moan in the distance. Some grim nemesis of our race is on the red man's trail, and wherever he goes, he will still hear the sure approaching footsteps of the fell destroyer and prepare to meet his doom, as does the wounded doe that hears the approaching footsteps of the hunter. A few more moons, a few more winters, and not one of all the mighty hosts that once filled this broad land or that now roam in fragmentary bands throughout these vast solitudes will remain to weep over the tombs of a people once as powerful and as hopeful as your own. But why should we repine? Why should I murmur at the fate of my people? Tribes are made up of individuals who are no better than they. Men come and go like the waves of a sea, a tear, a tamawas, a dirge, and they are gone from our longing eyes forever. Even the white man whose God walked and talked with him, as friend to friend, is not exempt from the common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We shall see. We will ponder our propositions, and when we have decided we will tell you. But should we accept it, I here now make this the first condition, that we will not be denied the privilege without molestation of visiting at will the graves of our ancestors and friends. Every part of this country is sacred to my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hollowed by some fond memory or some sad experience of my tribe. Even the rocks that seem to lie dumb as they swelter in the sun along the, along the silent seashores in solemn grandeur thrill with memories of past events connected with the fate of my people, and the very dust under your feet responds more lovingly to our footsteps than to yours, because it is the ashes of our ancestors, and our bare feet are conscious of the sympathetic touch, for the soil is rich with life of our kindred. The sable braves and fond mothers and glad-hardened maidens, and the little children who lived and rejoiced here, and whose very names are now forgotten, still love these solitudes, and their deep fastness at eventide grows shadowy with the presence of dusky spirits. And when the last red man shall have perished from the earth, and his memory among the white men shall have become a myth, these shores shall swarm with the invisible dead of my tribe. And when your children's children shall think themselves alone in the field, the store, the shop, upon the highway, or in the silence of the woods, they will not be alone. In all the earth there is no place dedicated to solitude. At night, when the streets of your cities and villages shall be silent, and you think them deserted, they will throng with the returning hosts that once filled and still love this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. Let him be just and deal kindly with my people, for the dead are not altogether powerless. Altogether powerless. Altogether powerless. Altogether powerless. Altogether powerless.